Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We're going to continue our sermon series through the Gospel of Mark. This morning is a message that is titled, The Secret of the Kingdom. The Secret of the Kingdom. And we'll look at that this morning in this passage. But if you notice... Mark chapter 4, and the way the gospel writer here, Mark, lays this out, is he's really building throughout this chapter on the topic of faith, right? The parable of the sower and what it is to take the word in and see that the word is changing, transforming the heart and what that is producing in that heart, in that life. And you see how Jesus is teaching throughout this chapter He's teaching his disciples and crowds that are gathering all about faith. And he's showing them how to use their faith. And then if you notice at the end of chapter 4, what does Jesus do? He's a master teacher. What does he do with his disciples? He tests their faith. He puts them on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Winds and waves raising up, about to capsize this boat. They're afraid, fearful, thinking they're going to die. And at the end of Mark chapter 4, what's he say? Do you still have no faith? So this whole chapter, Mark is building on this concept of faith and what it is to have faith in Christ and to walk with Christ. And Jesus here tests them. If you skip ahead to chapter 5, The first 20 verses there is about a demoniac in the Decapolis, an amazing story of transformation and what Jesus does in that life. And I want you to know over the next two weeks, we're going to be going through Mark chapter 4. On September 17, though, we're going to look at Mark chapter 5, but I have a special treat for you, a special treat. Get ready. On September 17, Mark chapter 5. Dale is going to preach for us that morning. Dale was just up here on guitar. If you haven't got to meet Dale and Marcy and Jane Allen, Clint, crew, have you met crew, little crew running around? And Miss, Miss Shirley here and Mr. Jan, and then Craig and Leandre, Easton, Bailey, this whole family, just an amazing, if you haven't got to talk to them, they're an amazing family. They love Jesus. They love the Lord. They love the church. Dale, if you didn't notice, or if you didn't know this about him, he's a retired pastor. In the area, and that's kind of like a Marine. If you, if you know anything about Marines, you tell a Marine, you're an ex-Marine, they get mad at you. Like, I'm not an ex-Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Oorah, right? Right? Oorah. There we go. I'm an Army. We, we don't, yeah, we don't say that oorah, but ooh, that's, how, that's how I look at pastors, though. Is it's, you might retire. You might, you might move out of that pastoral titled position at that church, but you're always carrying that shepherd's heart because that's the calling of Jesus on your life. Dale, though, it's been a, a wonderful time of just meeting with him and, and growing, getting some tips and tricks on pastoral ministry. Um, and he's going to preach for us on the 17th. And guess where I'm going to be? I'm going to be right there with you guys. That's, isn't that amazing? That's awesome. So September 17, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 4, though, this morning we're going to look at the parable of the sower and the explanation here that Jesus gives of the parable of the sower. But again, what Mark is trying to convey here through the teaching of Jesus Christ is what faith is. You have to hear the word. The word has to be received, and the word has to take root in a person's life, in a person's heart, and it has to begin to grow. And then that fruit that is produced, that faith, that salvation in Christ has to be produced in that life. And what Mark is trying to show is there's a progression. There's a response to the preaching of God's word. There's a response to the word about the kingdom, the message about Christ. There's a response to the gospel that is required in each heart and life. Faith, if you remember this, Romans 10, 17, faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. Think about that. So it's important what we hear. It's important that we hear the message about Christ, the gospel, the word of God that is being preached and proclaimed. It's important that we take that in. James says the the implanted word, and he describes the word, receiving the implanted word, he he says, which is able 
to save your soul. We understand the importance, the significance of the word about Jesus Christ, the message about Jesus Christ. But James doesn't stop there. He says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but a doer, not deceiving yourselves, right? Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer, deceiving yourself. Because that's where we can get caught up, friends. We can get caught up there, right? We can hear what it is to be saved by grace through faith in Christ, and we can stop there. That intellectual awareness of that message, an intellectual understanding that, yes, Jesus is who he says he is. I need to be saved, but I can still reject it in disobedience. Remember this about disobedience. Disobedience is the outpouring. Disobedience is the manifestation of what is in that individual's heart. And what is in that individual's heart is unbelief. Unbelief is lived out in a person through disobedience. Think about that in our day and age. We see that, right? Throughout this world, there is outright disobedience, defiance, and opposition to God. Showing a heart of unbelief. And with that heart of unbelief is hard-heartedness, rebellion, opposition, defiance against the living God, the creator of everything, the one who gave us the most wonderful gift of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord on a cross in the grave and raised to life, right? He gave us everything that we need to be saved in Christ by grace through faith in him, but this world stands oppositional to him. We're going to look at that condition of the heart this morning, the hard-heartedness there. But I want you to notice something in Mark chapter 4 before we jump into this parable. Look at verse 10. It says, when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about this parable. Look at verse 33. He was speaking the word to them with many parables like these as they were able to understand. He did not speak to them without a parable. Privately, look at that. Privately, however, he explained everything to them. You notice that? He got alone with his disciples and those around him. And he explained everything. The parable, he explained the the understanding or he gave them the understanding of that parable to them. He began to teach them privately. He got alone with them. They got alone with him and they felt the freedom to start asking questions about this parable. Hey, what does this mean, Jesus? You need to teach us. Out of all of this, that's my challenge for us this morning. How much time do you spend alone with Jesus? Think about that. How much time do you spend alone with Jesus? When we think about the three hearts that are negative, the three hearts that are defiant, oppositional, disobedient to God, and the good soil that receives, welcomes, produces fruit, we can look at that But we can miss that these disciples who were hearing this parable and hearing the teachings of Jesus got alone with Jesus. And I believe we miss that in our day and age. We miss that in our generation. We're busy. Amen? We are. That's, I'm just testifying to the truth there. That's the reality. But we have to get alone with Jesus Christ before we can see evangelistic fruit in our lives, before we can see the outpouring of the light of Jesus Christ in our relational circles and seeing people come to faith in Christ, the word of God must work in our lives first. The word of God has to do a work in your life first. And that requires us, friends, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ this morning, if you know Christ, if you know the Lord, if you've been adopted into that most wonderful family, sealed by the Holy Spirit, you need to find time to spend alone with Jesus Christ. He says that he is the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Why? Because you can do nothing without me, he says. 
Without Christ, we have no hope. Without Christ, we have no chance. We cannot produce fruit unless we ourselves are abiding in Jesus Christ. John chapter 15. And later in that chapter, he says, you need to produce fruit and your fruit also needs to abide. We abide in Christ, first of all, through salvation. Amen? We have to accept who Christ is and who we are. Standing in front of a holy and perfect and just God. Sinners condemned in our unrighteousness. And we have to believe that what Jesus Christ did on the cross, in the grave, and raised to life is enough to pay for my sins. And then I have to choose to go to Christ. I have to choose to receive the free gift of salvation, eternal life in Him. Amen? And then I abide in him by spending time with him in his word, spending time with him praying. When's the last time you just sat alone praying and reading God's word and listening to what he has to say in your life? How much time do you spend alone with Jesus? And I'm right there, folks. I am right there, front of the line. I am number one in line at this. There's a need. There's something that has to be done. I'm going to use my ambition, my strength, my drive to get it done. Give me a minute, God, I got this. Instead of stopping and praying and spending time with God, with Jesus, walking hand in hand with him so he can work in my life first. It's the same thing my dad tells me this as a pastor. Every Sunday he says, son, you got to have this book this message that you're preparing for everyone to hear has to preach to you first before you get up there. Think about that today. How much time do we spend alone with Jesus? We're going to look at this parable this morning. We're going to look at why Jesus used parables. We're going to define a parable this morning, and we're going to go back to the Old Testament just for a couple of passages because we need to see this. Why was Jesus using parables to teach Israelites. And can we learn from that now? Spoiler alert, yes, we can. Amen? Let's pray and we'll get started. Father God, thank you for your word. Jesus, we are learning what it is to spend time with you, alone time with you. You did this with your disciples. You exemplified this for us. You gave your your disciples and those around you time to ask questions. I can only imagine But Jesus, we get too busy for you. We move too quickly through this life. And we forget that you long to spend time with us. Please challenge us with that this morning. Convict us if that's necessary, God. By your spirit, convict us so that we will stop and carve out time. Work through our calendars to spend more time with you alone. Father God, we love you. Accept our time now in your word. Work by your spirit. Help us to be discerning eyes to see and perceive, ears to hear, to listen, to understand. God, open our hearts to you now and help us to posture our hearts towards you in this moment. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says again, He began to teach by the sea, the Sea of Galilee, and a very large crowd gathered around him. So he got into a boat on the sea and sat down while the crowd was by the sea on the shore. He taught them many things in parables and his teaching, and in his teaching he said to them, listen. So we stop right there just for a minute. Notice this, Jesus has a crowd gathered around him and he is continually teaching. Do you believe this morning that Jesus wanted people to learn? That is why he is teaching, amen? He wants them to learn. He wants them to have eyes that see, eyes that perceive. He wants them to have ears that listen, that hear, that understand. He wants these things from them. That's why he is painstakingly getting into a boat, putting the crowd on the shore, and he's speaking to a lot of people, teaching them now in parables. And the first thing he says here is, listen. He wants them to hear, listen. This is an imperative command here, listen. Everybody in that crowd should have kind of perked up. Okay, he's about to say something important. This is like, this is going to be on the test time. 
listen. And then he says, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. The gospel writer in Luke, Luke says, it lacked moisture, right? We see this when we throw some seeds down. If it comes up quickly, the sun just starts to bake it, scorches it, and it dies. It needs some water. It's got no roots. The roots can't go deep enough to find that water. Verse 7, other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it didn't produce fruit. Still other seed fell on good ground, and it grew up, producing fruit that increased 30, 60, and 100 times. Then he said, let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Again, Jesus is trying to get them to hear. Listen. Anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Verse number 24, pay attention to what you hear. If anyone has ears, verse 23, let him listen. Jesus wants these crowds to hear what he is teaching and to understand it. This is life. Verse number 10 says, When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. Make sure you catch that part. He is with the twelve, and they are asking him about the parables. That will be important here in a second. He answered them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those outside, everything comes in parables. Why? Verse 12, so that they may indeed look and yet not perceive. They may indeed listen and yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn back and be forgiven. So we need to look at what is a parable. Here's a simple Sunday school lesson that I was taught as a kid and it stuck with me. A parable is simply this. It is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's a simple explanation of a parable. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus is going to take something physical, something tangible, an element that can be touched. Here, he has a farmer. He has seed. He has, he has rocky ground. He has a pathway. He has thorns. There's the sun, there's birds. All of these physical elements are in this story, and he's going to give a spiritual implication to it all. There's an earthly, physical story with a spiritual implication or meaning or understanding that Jesus is teaching. So why did he preach or teach in parables? Verse 11, he says, The secret of the kingdom of God to the disciples and those around him has been given to you, but to those outside, everything comes in parables. Get that. He's speaking parables to everyone outside. There's an inside group here, a private group here, talking about entrance into the kingdom. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. Nobody enters into the kingdom except through him. This is, this is inside the kingdom and then to those outside. He is speaking to them in parables. And the reason why, verse 12, so that they may indeed look and yet not perceive. They may indeed listen and yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn back and be forgiven. You would think at first glance, Jesus is presenting parables here to keep people so confused and so bogged down that they will not turn back and repent. That's not what Jesus is doing. And that's not what that verse implies. If they would simply see with their eyes and perceive, listen with their ears and hear and understand, they would turn back and be forgiven, but they refuse. So now we have to go back to the Old Testament to see why is Jesus prophetically, why is he fulfilling this prophecy? Why is he speaking to this crowd of Israelites, the disciples here, in parables. Why is he doing this? Doesn't he want everyone to stop, to turn back and be forgiven? Go back to Isaiah chapter 6. This is really, really interesting. Isaiah chapter 6. It's like a sword drill.
Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 9. God speaking through the prophet Isaiah here, and he replied, Go, say to these people, to the Israelites, keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull, deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. At first glance, again, this looks like God is blinding them, deafening them so that they do not repent, turn back and be forgiven. But I want to show you this morning that this is a response to them. This is a response to his chosen people, the Israelites, and how they were posturing their hearts towards him. Turn to Zechariah chapter 7. Zephaniah, Zechariah. If you get to... Malachi, you've gone too far. You ever, ever heard the pastor say Malachi? Like the Italian book, Malachi? I think that's funny. Zechariah chapter 7. Remember, at first glance, that Isaiah passage looks like God is deafening ears, blinding eyes. He does not want them to turn back and repent. But he is simply responding to their hearts, their hard-heartedness. Look at this. Zechariah 7, starting in verse number 11. But they refused, speaking about the Israelites here, they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder. They closed their ears so they could not hear. They made their hearts like a rock so as not to obey the law or the words that the Lord of armies had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. Therefore, an intense anger came from the Lord of armies just as he had called, and they would not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord of armies. They refused to pay attention. They turned a stubborn shoulder. They purposely closed their ears so they couldn't hear. They closed their eyes so they couldn't see. They made their hearts like a rock, it says, hardening their hearts against God. Think about that. The prophet Zechariah here speaking, hey, hard-heartedness. What does that show? It shows unbelief and it comes out in disobedience. I am hard-hearted against God. The Israelites here, hard-hearted against God, not paying attention to him, turning a stubborn shoulder. I'm not going to listen. You ever seen a child do that? I'm not going to listen, mom. You get to Malachi. You get to God saying, hey, I'm going to send a messenger announcing the coming of the Messiah. But then you have 400 years of silence. They turn their shoulders, they harden their hearts against God, refusing to see, refusing to listen, refusing to perceive, refusing to understand. And Jesus is speaking parables to them for this reason. You don't want to listen? Fine. If you want to listen, listen. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Listen, hear, understand, receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Recognize Jesus is saying here in Mark chapter 4, hey, I'm the Messiah. But they didn't want to see him as he is. They did not want to hear the words that he was proclaiming. They turned shoulders, closed their ears, closed their eyes, hardened their hearts. This is not faith. This is defiance against God, hardening their hearts, saying, I'm going to rely on my system and what I have going on, my traditions the traditions of the elders, the law. I'm going to rely on all this. I'm not going to accept Jesus as Messiah. And that's why he was presenting parables to them. To everyone inside, the secret of the kingdom, Jesus is being revealed to everyone outside. They refuse to see, to listen, to perceive, to understand, to receive Christ as he is. 
He gets into this further in this explanation of the parable of the sower. Look at verse 13. Then he said to them, don't you understand this parable? Now speaking to his disciples in this crowd that's around him, alone with Jesus. Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? We have to look at this from two perspectives. First, if you don't understand this one, how are you going to understand all of them? This is an important parable. We're talking entrance into the kingdom, receiving the word as it's being spoken, acting on that word, allowing the word to work, to root in my life and heart, accepting who Christ is, believing in him, choosing to receive eternal life. Allow the word to work. If you don't get this one, you ain't getting any of them. And he was also telling his disciples who were Jewish, hey, if you're missing this, If you're not seeing this and and perceiving, if you're not listening and understanding, you're not going to hear any of the parables because you're going to be standing right there with the crowd of hard-hearted Israelites who refuse to see, who refuse to hear, who refuse to pay attention. Think about this. Who is he looking at in this moment? I could imagine that Jesus in this moment is looking at Judas who betrayed him. If you don't get this one, man, you're not going to get any of them. Imagine that. You're going to stay hard-hearted. Verse 14, the sower sows the word. Matthew 13, 19 says the word about the kingdom. So we know here the sower sows the word, the word about the kingdom, the message about Christ. This is a gospel presentation here. Verse 15, some are like the word sown on the path. So these people are path-like in their hearts. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word sown in them or in their hearts. Luke 8 verse 12 says, Satan takes away the word so that they may not believe and be saved. Satan, the enemy of God, the opposition, does not want the word about Jesus Christ to reach into and transform and regenerate hearts by the working of the Holy Spirit. He does not want that to happen. Jesus is not saying that Satan has the omnipotent power here to reach in and remove what is planted in someone's life. He is saying that Satan is working all kinds of signs and wonders and deception to keep people from hearing and listening and receiving the gospel. And Paul says the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. 2 Corinthians 4.4, in their case, those who are perishing, the God of this age, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this age, Satan, has blinded their minds, blinded their hearts, blinded their eyes because he does not want them to see Jesus. And Jesus is teaching here in Mark chapter 4, hey, you guys, watch out. Some people hear it. Immediately, Satan is there to take it away. Why? Because they are remaining in their hard-heartedness, defiant and oppositional to God. Jesus said there's two kind of people, right? Children of God and children of Satan. That's the option. John chapter 8, that's the option. Those on the path, those with the path-like heart, children of Satan, they remain in their unbelief. Verse 16, others are like seeds sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, look at this, immediately they receive it with joy. But they have no root. They are short lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. Again, Luke says, believe. They believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. Think about this the mercy and the grace of Jesus in this moment, teaching a group of Israelites through this parable. Those receive the word immediately. They, immediately they receive it with joy even. 
But then they fall away during a time of of distress, during a time of persecution. I believe Jesus is trying to get them to listen. Hey, guys, persecution, distress is coming for you. It's going to come. It's going to happen. Paul says about himself, I was once a blasphemer and persecutor, right? He persecuted the church. He persecuted the way. He persecuted those who would identify them themselves with Christ. He even arrested, imprisoned some of them, and approved of their deaths. And Jesus was saying, hey, hey, persecution is coming. Distress is coming. That's going to happen to you. And some who have received immediately with joy this word about Jesus, this word about the kingdom, will fall away because the word doesn't have an opportunity to root in them. They give up in a time of distress and persecution. The word cannot fully produce in them, moving them to salvation. They receive the word with joy, but no root is produced in their heart because distress and persecution come to their lives and they are in turn not saved. Again, Luke says, believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. I want to stop right here and note this for you. We can read that carefully and we can begin to argue then, then you can be saved and lose your salvation. That is not what Jesus is teaching here. Remember this belief here, this this intellectual, this head knowledge about the word, about the kingdom, the message about Christ is received with joy even. But it doesn't produce salvation in this heart because they face distress and persecution. As soon as distress and persecution came, they said, I'm not standing with Christ. I'm not with him. Remember this, folks. Belief has to be coupled with repentance. Jesus teaches this. Go back to Mark chapter 1. He says, after John was arrested... Going into Galilee, he proclaimed the good news of God. And this is it. Verse 15, Mark chapter 1. The time, Jesus said, is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. What does he say? In response to the kingdom of God coming near. What does he say? Repent and believe the good news. We said this last week at our baptism celebration. Repentance is metanoia. This is Changing my mind, accepting who Christ is and accepting who I am in my sin. That I need a Savior, amen? And believing that what Jesus did on the cross, in the grave, and raised to life again is what I need to be saved. Choosing to receive life from Him, eternal life, He says. He says, repent and believe the good news. This is not... A belief of salvation. That's not what Luke is saying here about this person. This is belief for a while that never turns into salvation and they fall away. Others are like seed, verse 18, Mark chapter 4, verse 18. Others are like seed sown among thorns. These are the ones who hear the word. But the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. The pleasures of life enter in and choke the word, and it, the word, becomes unfruitful in that heart, in that life. Think about that. Somebody who hears the word about the kingdom, the message about Christ, the gospel, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, they hear it, but the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things, the the pleasure of life enter in, choke the word, and the word cannot produce fruit in that heart. They don't go on to salvation.
Again, as soon as he said, this is like somebody who hears it. But the deceitfulness of wealth enters in and chokes it. Do you think he might have looked up and looked at Judas in that moment? Knowing that Judas was stealing money, knowing that Judas was going to betray him. Saying, hey, you're going to hear the word. You're going to hear it. But the deceitfulness of wealth is going to enter in and choke it, and it's not going to be able to produce fruit in your life. It's not going to move you to salvation. Can this happen in a Christian's life? Think about that. Can the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desire for more, the pleasure of life, can that enter into a Christian's life and choke out the word, the working of the word, the washing of the word by the Holy Spirit in that individual's life, making that Christian un unfruitful internally and externally? Can that happen? That happened to me. Turn to Luke chapter 21 real quick. I'm an eschatology nerd. If you didn't know that, I love end times prophecy. I love the book of Revelation. I love everything in the Bible about end times prophecy. I am just, that's one of my things that I just love. We talked about this probably several months ago. Hey, why do we need to talk about the return of Christ? Why do we need to talk about him coming soon? Why do we need to be alert, to be on guard? Why do we need to be watchful for him? Because it prevents, keeping our eyes on Christ and his soon return prevents us from being consumed by this world, being consumed by the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, the pleasure of this life, the desire for more and more. Look at this, Luke 21, verse 34, it says, Be on your guard. Why? So that your minds are not dulled from carousing, from drunkenness and worries of life, or that day will come on you unexpectedly. Folks, I'm a huge fan of, of prophecy, end-time prophecy and eschatology. I'm a huge fan of it because one thing it does for me in my heart is it helps me to remain alert. And it keeps me from having a dulled mind that is more concerned with, more focused on running around and getting drunk and partying and hanging out in this life. Keeping my eyes on Christ, being alert and, and staying fixated on him, the author and finisher of my faith, keeps me from getting consumed by the worries of this age. Folks, this can happen to a Christian. The worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, the, the desire for more and more, the pleasure of life can enter in, choke out the fruit production of the word in your life. And that happened for me for 13 years. This is why I say it's so important, folks. How much time do you spend alone with Christ? Right? The good soil, the good ground here, back in Mark chapter 4, verse number 20, and those like the seed sown on good ground hear the word. They welcome it, and it, the word, produces fruit in them 30, 60, and 100 times what was sown. Not just in them, but externally too, evangelistically outside of them. That's what this is saying. But remember, the word has to do a work in us first. Before I can go out and proclaim the name of Christ, the word has to do a work in me first. I have to be transformed. I have to be saved by grace through faith in Christ. Then I begin to walk with him and learn about him, and he begins to live in and through me, Galatians 2.20. And I begin to proclaim his name to those that I am in relationship with, and that's the fruit that God produces through my life by my life being completely surrendered to him. That's what happens with good ground. The word can take root in that heart. It can grow. 
It can produce fruit within them and externally outside of them. And Jesus is just trying to get them to listen. The three conditions of the heart that we looked at this morning, the path, the rocky ground, that thorny ground. Folks, those hearts remain hard-hearted, oppositional, defiant, disobedient to God because of their unbelief. That good ground receives the word, welcomes it, the word about the kingdom, the word, the message about Christ, the gospel, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the power of God unto salvation for those who believe, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. The gospel begins to change and transform them. This is the saving power, the saving grace of our God. And this is the response of the Israelites in this context to the message that Jesus was proclaiming. He was also telling them, hey, you guys are going to go out and proclaim the same message. And guess what? You're going to face these four soils, these four hearts. You're going to face the opposition. That's Satan. He wants to take it away. You're going to face rocky ground. You're going to face thorns. You're going to face people that are so consumed with the worries of this age. They don't, want, they don't want to have anything to do with the message about Jesus Christ. This is what you guys are going to face, apostles, disciples, when you go out and preach and teach and proclaim the message about Christ. This is what you guys are going to, are going to face. That's what Jesus is teaching here. But almost 2,000 years later, he knew that this was just as applicable to us in our generation now. Amen? This world stands hard-hearted against him, defiant, disobedient in their unbelief, condemned already, not wanting to receive this word, not wanting to hear it, not wanting to listen to it. For us as Christians, where the word has taken root and it has brought us to a point of salvation, accepting, believing, and choosing to receive the gift of eternal life in Christ. For us as Christians, we have to continue to be washed by the water of this word. We have to continue to be renewed in our minds, right? Transformed by the renewing of our minds. How does that happen in this book? You want to hear from God? Read his book. You want to hear from God aloud? Read it out loud. We have to spend time with Jesus. How much time do you spend alone with Christ? Really evaluate that today. How much time do I spend alone with Jesus Christ? We should be diligent pursuers of Christ. He is coming soon. I believe it. I know it. The Bible says it. Amen? God, thank you for this this morning. Thank you for this parable, Jesus, that you taught. Thank you that... Almost 2,000 years later now, it's still applicable to us today that we still see these rebellious, defiant hearts oppositional to your word and the working of your word in their hearts. But what about us? Recipients of your grace, living Jesus by the power of your re resurrection, knowing that our eternal lives are secure in you and that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We know that, Jesus. We stand on those promises. We constantly claim them. But then right now in this world, in this life, we trust you for our eternal life, but right now we are too busy for you. How true that is in my life and my heart. Jesus, help us to be challenged by this, that we will spend time with you, that you want to spend time with us, that we can go to you, that we can cry out to you with our, with our hurt 
Jesus, we can cry out to you when we don't understand. We can ask you questions and we can search for those answers in your word. And you promise that by your spirit, you would lead us and guide us into all truth. Help us. God, help us to see this this morning. Jesus, help us to be challenged by this so that we would spend more time with you. We need you now. This generation, this age, God, we need you. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can worship you freely in this place. Accept this song now of praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen.